and I know what you're thinking. Well, 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 but that's your job, that's your role. You're the safety officer, you know? But then the penny dropped. And he said, do you know what, Richard? I knew I should wear a harness. I chose not to. I'm frightened to death up here. And I hadn't actually really, actually I had not thought about it, this being the fact that it was me who could kill myself. The health and safety legislation cares about us all. Yet we unfortunately incur the wrath sometimes by the overzealous lawyer or environmental health officer from HSC. I'm setting you up for tomorrow, you can get your own back. And we need to have the tools and the confidence to actually counteract all this and do it properly. An event safety plan. Break, go for a job. <laughs> the event safety plan is probably one of the most important things that we could ever produce. Don't be, I'm in a room full of academics, so I shouldn't really be saying this. I say, don't actually think an event safety plan is 17,000 pages of research that no one's ever going to read. No disrespect to Irida. Um, <laughs> I've read this. Um, it can be as short as three or four pages. The bullet points. There's lots of ways of doing it, but these are just a few pointers. I teach the Diploma in Event Safety Management and for Derby University. Uh, I set it up six or seven years ago. And it's the only qualification you can actually get in this country for the job that I actually do. And I mark the event safety plans that the candidates actually produce. And I want to see in an event safety plan a description of the venue and the event. Why? It may well be that the venue is not designed for the purpose you're going to use it for, which in the world of outdoor events <laughs> is nearly always the case. It's a street. It's Battersea Power Station. We're just taking over Farmerlow in London and the prison in London, which are totally excited and turn them into, into Horse. We've got, we have one and a half million pound wedding receptions there at the weekend and Paul McCartney has his birthday there and things like that. And these are in Derrill sites in the middle of London. They weren't designed for the purpose that you're going to use them for. And one of the skills in doing a risk assessment and site design, which we can't cover today, is to understand what happens when you bring those two together. When you superimpose an event on top of a venue. And I remember doing Edinburgh Hog Grenade, which is the first picture on the slide that you all came into in 1996 and I requested that Edinburgh City Council remove the railings at the side of Princess Street which are there to stop you walking out in front of a car today. I asked them to be removed before we had Ocean Colour scene played there on New Year's Eve in 1996. That was in the risk assessment. The local authority refused to take the railings out. I flagged it up with the police, environmental health and the chief exec four days before. They said they're not doing it. Lo and behold, on that evening, the crowd pressure pushed the street railings over and crushed people sitting on the other side. And one of our bestest friends in the old wide world who didn't know then, she happened to be on that railing getting crushed. And probably on the second bottle of malt, they might not have noticed it. But it was me who got dragged in front of the chief exec Monday morning. And it was me that met the most irate, obnoxious guy I've ever met in my life. And I'll remember his comments because they were so short and not sweet. It was right, Lynn. You've seen the front page of the papers. You're the safety officer. Your fault. I was really quite pleased. And not a lot winds me up, because to do my job, you have to be a bit of a cool cookie and cope with all sorts of pressures. But I did actually turn around and I threw the risk assessment across the desk and said, look, Chief Exit, what does that say there? Oh, here's the memo I sent you from the Environmental Health and the Police four days ago. His comments were, ah, Richard, so you're blaming me? I said, no. What I'm saying on this occasion is not me. That's a wake-up call. I wrote the risk assessments, and my guys write risk assessments several a week. That's what we do for a living. And it is so scary, because if something's missing, and something goes wrong, it's the person who wrote it, and even if you pass it around the department, have it signed off, you all take a responsibility for it. You can't get rid of it. So it's an incredibly important issue. Licensing and permissions, we'll talk about tomorrow. Another 
key thing that I want to see in a in an event safety plan is organisational structure. Who the hell is in charge of the event? Whose event is it? Which one of you in this room am I going to see in Crown Court next week because you're accused of killing somebody? Is it you? Do you think it's the person sitting next to you? Do you think it's the person behind you? Do you think it's your boss? Because if it's you, you need to understand the responsibilities that you're taking on. And we all do, but knowing the responsibilities, you can surround yourself with the competence and the tools you need to actually do it properly and make sure you do it properly. You want to put in the health, safety and welfare stuff, the generic risk assessments, crowd management, um, emergency procedures. How do we actually get out of the space? If we ever privileged enough to come on one of Derby University's event safety diploma courses, you'll hear of Limbo's number one and number two rule. Number one rule is you never put too many people in a space. And number two is you always make sure you can get them out. I actually don't care if this building is not standing in the morning. Somebody will, it's an immense value. But I don't care if it burns down tonight, so long as each and every one of us is sitting across the road watching it. And that's with venues. And universities are the worst. Universities don't care how many people they ram in a room, like, you know, gala balls and things like that. They don't look at occupant capacities. They've got little rooms, they just over... And I've had phone calls from organisers in London, one a particularly famous organiser, which I'm not going to name, rang me up a few months ago and said, Richard, I'm in court for over capacity one of my nightclubs in London. Can you represent me on Monday morning? I said, what do you mean by over capacity? He says, three times the limit. No, that's just taking the mic. That's not an accident, is it? I mean, come on, that is disgusting. Yeah, if you do a little simple, simple little test, when you're bored tonight, or too drunk, wander around the venues in Bournemouth and just see how many fire exits you can see blocked. Either locked, parked cars, rubbish on them, or Christmas is a good time because we like to actually fill all our fire exits with Christmas trees so you can't get out. Or you go to a restaurant and there's tables and chairs everywhere. I just think that just that one simple thing is absolutely disgusting and frightening. You won't dare go out anywhere else ever again. But that one thing is, you're in a space and you can't actually get out. It's not rocket science, is it? I did a Jerry Hallowell book signing a few years ago in Watford, Tesco's, just for 400 people. And I had a little space in the middle of the supermarket. And I wanted to check the fire exits to make sure my 400 people can get out. And there's three fire exits at the bottom. Do they open? Yes, they do. They've got really man signs, the alleyways are, alleyways are clear. Stood in there and it opened into a piazza about the size of this room. I looked to my right, no way out. It was called the plant room, 10 foot high brick wall. I looked straight ahead, full thorn hedge, as high as me. I looked to my left, which should have been the way out, completely blocked with shopping trolleys. I was with the safety officer and the regional director the supermarket and they were speechless but it's not rocket science is it you don't need a degree in event safety you just need to engage brain 95 percent of what you need to do is, is common sense and you all sit there and say oh health and safety just common sense yeah, i agree 95 percent of it is i'll tell you what you're not going because you walk around with your eyes closed means of escape you have to put in an event safety plan i want to know your calculations of how many people you can get in that space and I want you to know how long you've got to get into a place of safety and I want you to prove it to me before you fail miserably. Noise control. Toilets. Medical. We won't go through the whole list. Event inspections, accident reporting, all needs to be in there. Contractor documents. Do we vet our contractors? Or do we think we vet our contractors? I had a phone call from the Northern Local Authority not long ago. Richard, 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 we were in an accident in one of our parks. Somebody uh, was having a ride on the forklift truck, they turned it upside down, they cut the bloke in half, the park director's there, there's a body there, a body there, 18 scap in the middle, and HSC and the police are there, they're approved contractors of ours, and the guy's dead. This could be you, it could be your park. It's one of my colleagues. It's a dead body there. And they want me to look at their documents the next day? The insurance policy was a year out of date, the risk assessments were non-existent, the health and safety policy was one page, 
with one paragraph in it, undated and unsigned, and structural calculations for stays also provided with 10 years out of date. But they're an approved contractor. Don't we look at paperwork? Don't we vet them properly? Don't we care? We're overworked and too busy to do it properly. But we can catch up with you. Think safe, act safely, be safe. Is that what I'm doing for time? Oh, that's cool. That was taking the cross the road this morning. <laughs> Has anybody got any questions, any points? Have I frightened you all? I haven't got time to tell any more stories because I was, I was, I was actually only given half an hour to start with, but I was very generously given a little bit of extra, so I was keen to finish on time. There must be some questions. I can actually talk for three days on event safety management. Can I ask something? Yes. Um, you're right. We bow to you. Absolutely no question about it. People who've worked in the industry know the risk and try their best. Blah blah. One of the problems is something you could never have predicted. Tell us something about some of those. You could never have predicted oh. something would happen. Like the dust cloud from the volcano? Yeah, something Well, you can't predict that, can yeah. you? Or, or a freak tornado? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 those sort of things that you just can't predict. Yeah. And, um, you know, but that's not reasonably, no, no, it's, no, that's, no. it's not significant or reasonably foreseeable. No. But shouldn't you foreseen it? I mean, those ones where the, the inflatable oh, disappeared we well, should know what the wind is, and that but brings us around to Chinese lanterns, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm president of the National Outdoor Event Association. I'm going to embark on a campaign shortly um, to try and get the things banned following the, you know, the horrendous fire in, in the East Midlands this week. Yeah. But you know, they are, they are something that are readily sold and readily available, mm -hmm. and you can let them off. And um, they have caused problems with cattle and fires. Um, but yeah, you can't foresee everything. I mean, a guy said to me, um, my office is in Birmingham, although I haven't been there for two years. Um, I can't stand the place. I work down the garden. It's a lot more nicer. But there's a guy said to me, do we have to worry about crocodiles in the canal in Birmingham? And I said, of course not. Well, you know, to put in some emphasis, I cycled across Australia a few years ago, and the, the, the challenge was to do um, south to north, unsupported, solo on a push bike. And... Um, I think some of you may be from that part of the world. Um, it's a bit hot. I did the Stuart Highway and I did it in September and it was very hot. There's hardly anybody about. And you obviously, you need to do a risk assessment. Not legally, but it's in your interest. Because if you don't take what you exactly need to survive, and I slept in the bush rather a lot because I couldn't cycle the distances between roadhouses. I could only afford to carry, because of my physical ability and the size of the bike, what I desperately needed. And I couldn't actually take luxuries. That's what you need to do for an event. A risk assessment is to provide exactly what you need to do it safely, so far as reasonably practicable and words like that, which I won't bore you with now. And not go completely utterly over the top. Then when something goes wrong, there's nothing more you could possibly have done. You know, I had another manslaughter case about a cave diver in the Brecon Beacons, and he did absolutely everything right. He was one of the top leading cave divers in the world. A trainee soldier died in a cavern in the Brecon Beacons. But he was found not guilty. It happened. And there was nothing he could possibly have done to stop that particular death. It must still be awful to, to, to live with that. Yeah. But, you know, and the law doesn't expect you to have a 100% safe. It talks about reasonably foreseeable, reasonably practical, and things like that. Well, I must have run out of time there. Yes, I'm going to ask, I'm sorry to mention, I'm going to ask one question. You mentioned the personal guide, and you said there is no checklist. So, what is that relationship between? The, the purple guide, have you all seen the, the new draft? Yeah. The purple guide is supposed to reflect good practice, not best practice. Because best practice is something that's dynamic. And best practice is what we can actually do today with all the facilities that we've got on board. Um, and, and, it, and it is, I emphasize, only a guidance document. Um, and you can actually deviate away from the purple guide if you've got expertise and confidence in other areas. I mean, I, I, I actually put five drummers in a, on an MOD in South Africa, actually, on the docks in a crane above the harbour, strapped them in, playing drums at 100 foot in the air, and it was against all their risk management. The MOD, they said, give me 25 minutes, and I'll show you how we can do it properly and safely. 
because the particular organiser actually wanted to have five people playing drums from a crane from everybody. Don't know why, but yeah. But I also had somebody come to me the other day and said, I've got this sheet of glass, Richard. And what I do, I put it on the stage, I wrap a big bandage around it, I suck it in mess, and uh, I set fire to it. Then when it's burnt, I get a big hammer and I smash it. Now, who isn't thinking why? <laughs> it's what she does for a living, leave her alone. But this has is associated with that. Have you all seen the woman with the angle grinder who does rather erotic things with it? Sparks everywhere? Well, we've worked with her as well. You can actually do these things if you manage it properly. And I know I've run out of time and I could talk forever and I'm just getting wound up. Are you? All right, I, I, just, uh, I think everyone's been thrilled by what you've actually had to say and I did stop Dimitri at the Oh. Oh. I've got all night. How, how did you turn around um, the boss who is really busy um, running the thing? He's thinking about the cost, and you know you're talking to him about uh, about risks mm -hmm. that they're obvious, but he simply cannot deal with them. The boss tried to educate the boss, yeah. send him on a training course, which work, which which in where well the training courses that that I've associated with been talked about as being awesome because not only are they informative but we actually spend a lot of time making you think about things when you go wrong and how sensible health and safety legislation actually is and I think too many bosses I mean you can send him on a course and talk about corporate and subordinate responsibilities and he doesn't do anything you just got to try and stimulate the old brain cells and showing pictures of the eight year old boy that's died showing pictures of the guy who jumped off a bungee jump uh, rope not long ago and they got the wrong um, strength rope on it and the guy decked it on the pavement, you know? Let's look at pictures. I cut my teeth on Hillsborough. I had to go to, to uh, France. And uh, sorry, I went to Barcelona, to New Camp, um, when the stadium asked me to go, to do a heartfelt presentation on Hillsborough. And I showed all the football associations in Europe pictures of the kids up against the fence. I cried, they cried. But afterwards, people came up and said, we've got to take our primitive defensive damage, you know? And I hate football. And I wasn't even around when Hillsborough happened. But there's ways of actually just touching the, you know, he might, he might have children of his own. You know, that's how he, the thing is to make people think. If you leave this room now and think, ah, oh, well, that was not too bad for the end of the day, but you forget about it in another half an hour's time, I failed miserably. If you talk about this presentation halfway through the dinner tonight, say, oh, I didn't realize that. I've been a little bit more successful. But what I want to do, I don't know how many people's in this room, 30 people, 40 people. I'm looking for some more disciples. I'm on a mission. I'm 57 now, and I've spent 20 years trying to actually improve safety standards in the world. At the same time, improve the quality of the events that we've got in the world and do more exciting things. And I can't do that on my own. If I converted half of you, I've had a good day. If I converted all of you, fantastic. <laughs> and you know where to get me if you need me. Well, I presume you do. But I can keep going, but I'll yeah, Thank you very much.